Good morning, everyone. I'm here to talk to you about Zika virus, an emerging pathogen. I'm not conflicted, unfortunately, because we don't have any funding for this study yet. But anyway, um, the objectives here, and the annoying mosquito will stop. I just thought it was cute. <laughs> But it will stop eventually. Mosquitoes are annoying, so that's the message I'm trying to convey. So I'm going to, um, over, um, over the next hour, provide some information on the biology and epidemiology of Zika virus, um, and also describe the recent epidemic in Brazil. And we're going to review some uh, research questions and challenges uh, uh, that we are faced with now, and also explore the link between infection and microcephaly and other potential complications. And also, I'll present to you some work in progress on Zika virus transmission that we've been doing in the last uh, few months. So this is the Zika forest. This is the v Zika forest in Uganda. It's actually 30 kilometers uh, south of Entebbe. And uh, in 1947, this virus was uh, isolated from primates um, in this forest. So what is Zika virus? You know, I didn't know what Zika virus was, I have to confess, until November, um, when I was actually in Brazil and, and all the newspapers started talking about Zika virus and microcephaly. And, so what, and people would come and say, what is Zika virus? I said, well, I guess a mosquito transmits it. But we've um, done the homework. It's, it's an arbovirus, which just means it's an arthropod-borne uh, virus. It's a flavivirus. It's also known as ZIKV. And it's in the same category as other flaviviruses, such as dengue, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, West Nile virus. And uh, it was isolated by, the, by the, this Dr. Dick in 1947 in Uganda. And I have here, if you can see, this uh, faint report. It's one of the first reports of Zika in a patient who volunteered to be infected so they could uh, show the symptoms. And this was published in 1956. So it was first identified in humans in, in Nigeria in the early 1950s, but it was a virus that really remained dormant, you know, um, below our radar screen. It didn't cause much problems um, in the last 50 years. And uh, until 2015, it had been identified in individuals in Africa and also Asia, and uh, studies showed antibody po positivity in, in people who came from these areas. So this is just a classification to show you where Zika virus stands. It's in the Flaviviridae family of viruses. Um, so um, all of these uh, listed in that column are flaviviruses, and including St. Louis. Um, just to remind you, dengue and chikungunya and yellow fever usually coexist in the same places. Uh, but chikungunya is a different virus. It's a toga virus. So serologic tests for chikungunya would not interfere with a Zika virus diagnosis. I just want to say this here before, before I forget, further down the road. But what do these viruses cause? They can cause an apparent infection, an unspecific febrile illness, a r illness with a rash, hemorrhagic fevers, and encephalitis. This is, in general, what all these uh, arboviruses can cause if you look at their features. So Zika virus is a single-stranded RNA virus. It's in the group four of the flaviviruses. It's the genus flavivirus, and the species is Zika virus. It's a fairly simple virus. It's enveloped. It has this icosahedral shape. It contains uh, about 11,000 nucleoside, nucleotides, which encode for 3,419 amino acids. And it can be killed by ether, um, chloroform, or sodium dioxycholate, if you're like very afraid of Zika virus. So it, it's similar in structure to the other flaviviruses. I'm not a molecular biologist, but um, I, you see in the lower figure, this is the genome of a, flav, uh, of a flavivirus. And they're all very similar, especially Zika virus is very similar in its genome to dengue virus. The reason I'm mentioning this because this is very important for serologic diagnosis, because the genome is very similar. The antibodies that are produced are also similar in structure, and there's a lot, a lot of cross-reactivity in the current antibodies. In terms of virulence factor, there's this E protein, which covers most of the virion surface and is involved in the replication, and it's involved in host cell binding and membrane fusion. So transmission, which is the most important part. Uh, transmission is predominantly through mosquitoes as vectors. It's uh, spread like dengue, yellow fever, chikungunya. So uh, generally, if you look in nature, probably it's the uh, primates that have antibodies, uh, although uh, interestingly enough, they're rodents who also have antibodies to Zika virus. And it's, it behaves very much like all the other flaviviruses in this sense, that you need a, a mosquito vector and a mammalian host. And there are a lot of mosquitoes in the uh, genus uh, Aedes that are responsible for this. The mosquito, that the polka dot mosquito, is the Aedes aegypti, which in Brazil is the one that transmits the virus. But several other mosquitoes, which actually do exist here in Southern California, 
could transmit the virus. But I don't want to add to the panic of this. Uh, climatic conditions are different. We're, go we're going to talk about that later. So the incubation time in the mosquito is about 10 days. And these mosquitoes only live about 30 days. So it's, uh, they have to be very efficient spreaders because within their lifespan, um, they have a short time um, to be able to ex uh, uh, transmit disease. The distinguishing factor about Zika virus is that human-to-human -human infection is possible, and that's the first time that happens with an insect-borne uh, disease. That's the first time that's ever been described. So that's, that's sort of a very distinct factor. And um, in Brazil, it's transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito. It's the same mosquito that transmits dengue, that also transmits uh, yellow fever in the Amazon basin, and it's transmitted by the female mosquito. So the f uh, female mosquito here comes again. It's a polka dot mosquito, so it's easier to remember that it's a female mosquito. It's a, primarily a daytime feeder. It's different from the malaria mosquito, which will bite you uh, at dusk and dawn. This one bites you any time during the day. But if you've been to Rio and, you, and other places, you know that they bite all the time at night, too, if you don't turn the air conditioning on. It's so very annoying. Uh, they live where humans like to live. And uh, what is very important for their elimination and control is that they lay their eggs and they produce the larva in artificial containers. So after rain, they usually put their eggs in, in like tires that have accumulated water and potted plants and swimming pools and water ponds, anything that hasn't been cleaned. That's where they, they put all their um, eggs. So in terms of replication and transmission, um, we don't know much about the pathogenesis of Zika virus, but if it behaves like the other flavivirus, there's no reason to believe it wouldn't. Um, the virus is transmitted to human in the mosquito saliva, then it will replicate in the human and target organs. It will infect white blood cells and lymphatic tissues. Uh, we know that the Zika virus might be more neurotropic. The virus is released, then it's circulated in blood. The person has a brief period of viremia. Then a second mosquito comes around, bites the person, and becomes infected. And then the virus will go into the midgut of this mosquito and other organs, and then it infects the mosquito salivary glands. And so when this mosquito bites again through the saliva, it spits. It spits where it bites, so it's sort of gross. And then it will um, infect uh, humans this way. So this is a, just a paper from Brazil in November when the Zika outbreak, it says three viruses and one mosquito. And of course, the concern that we have dengue, chikungunya, and Zika all coming at once and hitting the country very hard, especially in the coastal areas. So what do you do about controlling this? Well, you have to control the vector. And you can use larvicides to uh, kill immature aquatic stages. You can use uh, fumigation. But fumigation is not very good against adult mosquitoes. And mosquitoes can develop resistance uh, to several uh, insecticides. The best uh, way to control this is to really eliminate their larva, eliminate the habitats, and go in and get rid of all the places where you accumulate water, potted plants, tires, ponds. And actually, there is a mosquito control um, police in Brazil that's actually been in existence for over 30 years. And they have the authority to go into homes and get rid of all your potted plants and all the water and all the tires. Uh, they actually have police authority to do so to try to eliminate the, the vector. So you want to reduce especially the female vector so that transmission won't occur. And that's the, the assumption that if you eliminate the vector, of course, you will impact uh, the environment and you will uh, control the epidemic. How, however, you don't know how much you have to reduce the vector in order to prevent transmission. But this has been proven to be effective. So as I said before, there are several modes of transmission. There's also perinatal transmission and bloodborne transmission. And uh, in the human, the incubation period is three to six days. And we already talked about the mosquito. So this is the first report, uh, one of the first reports. Actually, um, there were some um, sc scant reports from Africa. But this is the proven uh, report of sexual transmission of Zika virus. This was a scientist from Colorado, an entomologist who was in Senegal. He acquired what is called Zika fever. We shouldn't really call it Zika fever because it doesn't cause fever, and we'll go into that later as much. Um, but anyway, he acquired Zika. He came back home to Colorado and infected his wife. She came down 10 days later with symptoms of Zika virus. And uh, their four kids were not infected, so it was through sexual transmission. If she had been bitten by a mosquito that came with him, it would have been a different incubation period. And they actually, both of them, this is Brian Foy and his wife, Joy Foy, they, they reported their domestic incident. So it's in the literature if you want to. <laughs> So um, yeah, so in any case, uh, there's also a paper from the French Polynesia that also reports detection of a virus in the semen of a patient who went in to be treated for, 
uh, low sperm count and they found the virus there. And then there are subsequent reports that had just come out in the last month about this. So um, also there have been reports of transmission through blood transfusion. This is from an outbreak in French Polynesia. And uh, this was done actually by PCR. They found 3% of blood donors being positive for Zika virus. Uh, this is during a time of um, an epidemic as well. So this is, alerts us to a potential problem. And then uh, from the French Polynesia, we have a report of uh, perinatal transmission of Zika virus. Actually, there were two babies, two babies that were um, in this report. And it was identified, these were women infected right before they gave birth. And the newborns were born with symptoms of Zika virus um, with a nonspecific febrile rash. Both of them recovered and did uh, fairly well. So where do you find Zika virus? Zika virus is found in saliva. It's been reported um, to be isolated in the saliva of patients. Actually, it's a good way of detecting the virus. It's been done prim primarily for research purposes. Uh, it's not really known if the virus in the saliva is a viable virus, which can be um, transmitted from person to person that remains to be investigated, but it definitely can be found there. And virus in urine is uh, definitely found. We have in our cohort that I'll describe to you uh, several patients who were detect had virus detectable in the urine by PCR. And actually, the kinetics of the virus is such that when you're viremic, you probably can have virus identified in your bloodstream for about a week, maybe even shorter, three to six days. And in the in the urine, it, it is longer. It, it, it is detectable a little later, but you can find it for 14 to 20 days following acute infection. So briefly about the epidemics, there was an epidemic in Micronesia in 2007 in the Yap Islands, and there were uh, several uh, suspected cases. Uh, 49 were confirmed, 59 um, probable, and it was estimated that 73% of this population was actually in, um, infected during the epidemic. And um, from this report, it says that the patients didn't develop clinical illness. And we'll talk about the diagnostic conundrum, because if this were an, a dengue um, endemic area, it's hard to do serologic diagnosis because of cross-reactivity. But at least, I think this was done by serology, um, that's what they reported. And then the next epidemic we heard was in the French Polynesia in 2013, in the end of, of the year. And there was a serious dengue outbreak, and then Zika virus um, uh, showed its its face there, and there was a lot of uh, cases identified with acute infection. 11% of the population seemed to be affected, and there was a rise in the cases of Guillain-Barre reported from, from the islands, and it's unclear how the virus uh, reached the South Pacific. So until this outbreak, there wasn't really anything ever serious reported with Zika virus. It was thought to um, cause a fairly benign transient um, viral illness uh, with a rash. But then after, subsequently, a lot of other places in the South Pacific reported um, Zika virus. And um, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, it's, it's good enough. This is a report in the Lancet just showing how the virus spread. As you can see, up to 2005, it was uh, constricted to Africa and maybe some parts of India and Thailand. And then by uh, 2015, it had moved to the islands of the South Pacific and now to the Americas. Uh, and so it's moved towards it's gone east. So um, on its travel to South America, it stopped in Eastern Island. There was an outbreak identified in Easter Island and also was reported in Australia in 2014. And I just want to mention, there's only one Zika virus, but the virus is not the same. Uh, there are differences in the genome sequences. The African lineage is different from the Asian lineage, and you can trace where the virus came from by doing uh, genome sequencing. And the one we have in Brazil is uh, the Asian lineage from Polynesia. So this is a recent report. Um, this is from the European CDC, which is reporting where there is Zika virus activity. And I, I suppose this is uh, Tocnus um, cases of Zika virus, which means cases acquired locally, not uh, imported cases like is the case in the United States. So this is all local transmission. As you can see, it spread um, fairly quickly. And let's talk now about the epidemic in Brazil. So what happened in Brazil is that in the first semester of 2015, health authorities started noting uh, the presence of this disease that looked like dengue, but it caused like a pruriginous rash. The fever was not often present, and it behaved slightly different. And initially, they were reported as dengue uh, cases to the surveillance mechanism. Um, and uh, then they thought, well, it doesn't look like dengue. Could it be chikungunya? The serologies were negative. And then in March, um, the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, which is the premier, uh, the first research foundation in Brazil, identified Zika virus by PCR in the uh, blood specimens of some of these patients. 
And then the virus was sequenced, and it was found that it, was, it had the same lineage as the South Pacific strain. And where did Zika virus come from? It's thought that it might have come uh, during the World Cup in 2014. There was also um, um, a report of a rowing competition in northeastern Brazil around the same time um, in uh, 2014, and that athletes from Micronesia and the French Polynesia came at that time. So it's, it's thought that it was like this big global event that brought it to Brazil. But um, the state in the north, it's Rio Grande do Norte, all of northeastern Brazil, which is highly endemic for dengue, has been affected. And this is just a clipping from the paper talking about the WHO alerting about the possibility of Zika and, and the risk of microcephaly. So um, the virus was reported in Brazil, uh, documented in uh, 2015 in June. Um, the transmission from the French Polynesia to Brazil was characterized. They sequenced the virus, and the outbreak uh, was very uh, significant in Bahia, where they reported the epidemic. And then, finally, the virus reached Rio de Janeiro, uh, it's my hometown. And uh, it was, these are actually, many of these are people I'm collaborating with right now. Um, the first author is a longtime person I've been worked, I've worked with in uh, HIV studies. And um, it, it reached for you, it was identified actually in an HIV-infected patient. That's why there are a lot of people here who work with HIV in this group. So uh, the virus rapidly spread in Brazil to um, the northeastern states and then to other parts of uh, South America. Now, briefly, let's talk about Zika fever. You shouldn't call it uh, Zika fever because only 28% or less of patients actually have a fever with it. Um, that's what um, our data has been showing. But if you do have a fever, it's low grade, you have headaches, you have a rash. This rash is highly perigenous. You, you, will have, you can have conjunctivitis, arthralgias, uh, edema, um, not really of the joints that we've seen so much, but more of the hands and feet. And of course, you should evaluate in patients here in the US if there's been uh, travel to any potential endemic area in the last two weeks. So um, according to the WHO, 25% of individuals with Zika virus uh, become infected. They're asymptomatic. Actually, in Brazil, there's a lot of skepticism that this is indeed the case because you've been unable to identify uh, asymptomatic infection thus far. But we'll go into that in a little, in a little bit. So here are the list of symptoms that, that you can have. Uh, G GI symptoms are not as frequent, and respiratory symptoms are very rare. Um, and I'll, I have another table here where I'll show you. I just want to highlight that some of the features are very similar to rubella, with the mild fever, with the conjunctival injection, with the rash that starts on the face and then descends. The patterns are very similar. The rash is very similar. And also the aching joints is a common feature. Uh, the coryza is not um, uh, seen in, in Zika, but it's seen in rubella. And Dr. Cherry is here in the audience, and he can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, OK. So um, here is a cohort that I'll talk to you about in, in more detail that we've been uh, following in Brazil of um, pregnant women with Zika virus. We've had um, 72 women identified since um, late 2015. And I just want to show you the common features. Um, the rash usually lasts about uh, four days in our group, but in one woman it lasted as long as 14 days. The rash is either macular or macular papular. Granted, 100% of these women had a rash because this was the inclusion criteria for entry, so um, we can't speak to asymptomatic infection or infections without a rash. But in any case, in this population, this is the type of rash they had. That was followed by pruritus. 95% uh, of our patients overall had pruritus, even Zika virus negative women. Um, these are women identified by PCR. Conjunctival injection was prevalent. Uh, lymphadenopathy was also found in 40% of patients, either cervical, retroauricular, or generalized. Uh, fever, as I had highlighted before, um, was not so common. It was only in 28% of patients. And when fever did happen, it was for less than a day. And it was very low grade, 37.5, if you even consider that a fever to 38 degrees was what was reported in the case report forms. And then the other symptoms are, are there. Uh, as you can see, respiratory symptoms, uh, coryza, coughs, sore throat, only 7% of the patients reported that. So this is just to highlight what the clinical features are. And these are some pictures, which I hope you can uh, see. Um, this is a macular papular facial rash, which most people have. The rash starts on the face and then descends. Um, that's my colleague's hand on the patient's abdomen. That's to show you that it's a blanching rash. Um, <laughs> And this is a macular papular uh, rash of the arms. And on the legs, you have like this 
thin lacy reticular rash as well. These are different patients, so it's not all in the same patient. And as you can see, you have a retro or articular um, lymph node, which we have been told is also called Castellani node. In very severe dengue infection, patients can have that. But it reminds us, of course, of rubella. You can have conjunctival injection, palpable um, erythema, and a swollen, uh, swollen foot. Um, and this woman actually said it hurt a lot, and it was difficult for her to, to walk, which makes it a differential with chikungunya. And this is just an internet picture of someone um, with dengue with a rash. As you can see, you can get very confused, especially when you're having Zika on top of a, a dengue epidemic. Um, that's, it's hard to distinguish. This looks like an angrier rash, but dengue has a spectrum of manifestations. Zika virus complications. OK, in Brazil, there have been deaths reported to Zika virus in infants that were born with microcephaly. Of course, that's not a complete association yet. But um, there, have been there have been cases of encephalitis with deaths. Actually, my colleague in Brazil had a patient three weeks ago that died of encephalitis. She was not pregnant. Um, there have been individuals who are on immune suppression that actually have died from Zika virus. But in general, people are very concerned. Um, we have um, people who are not pregnant, who have men. Oh, I don't want to go because I will acquire Zika virus. It's a deadly disease. But you should be more afraid of getting dengue. Um, dengue is far more um, dangerous. It can cause far more problems. If you've ever had it before, the second time around, you can have hemorrhagic dengue. Zika is really a trans and benign illness in non-pregnant patients. Or, and, and so that's what I want to show to you. It's, it, it, does, it is linked to Guillain-Barre syndrome, but we're talking about an epidemic that's reaching a population of 210 million people with no prior immunity. So of course, any viral complications will arise from that, and there'll be big numbers because it's a, it's a virgin population, so to speak. So, and we'll talk a little bit about microcephaly. So um, the media in Brazil is actually um, very helpful in explaining what everything was. The two weeks I was there in November, every day there was a different um, topic in the science section of the newspaper in Rio telling you, understand the Guillain-Barre syndrome. As we know, it's um, the viral illnesses can be associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome. It's an autoimmune process, it, and it leads uh, it should be leading to destruction of the myelin sheets. And uh, we know it's autoimmune, your antibodies um, start um, attacking you because they confuse your myelin sheets with, with uh, antigen particles. And you treat it with IVIG or plasmapheresis. We all know what it is, pretty serious condition. However, Zika virus and neurological disease, um, it is thought that the virus is a neurotropic virus. In the 1950s, actually, they, they looked at this, but they couldn't really infect primates with the virus. Um, and they tried very hard. They only, only rodent models were successful in showing some pattern of neurotropism. But there was, in 2013, a higher incidence of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, you could argue that this is actually an autoimmune process, not necessarily um, you know, neurotropism of the virus. But what we're seeing now in fetuses definitely uh, speaks to the effect that the virus is very ne neurotropic. And we'll get into this right now. So this is just showing that cases of Zika arrived in the southeastern uh, region of Brazil and the life cycle of the mosquito, which was in the newspapers. And I just want to highlight here, this is from a dengue slide, just showing um, that dengue was very endemic in Latin America in the 1930s. There were significant uh, vector control efforts um, done in, the 19, in 1935, 1940, actually by Osvaldo Cruz and his, his, his team in Rio, which um, pretty much eradicated um, um, the vector in all of Latin America. And then, of course, it sort of fell apart and uh, the vector control measures were stopped. There were like economic problems and the, and the mosquito came back and dengue resurged in the Americas. And as you can see, um, this is just a map of where dengue is in Brazil. And this is from 15 years ago, but it's still the case today. Dengue has been highly endemic. So when you have Zika virus uh, on the, yeah, and you have the vector there and dengue's there, that's the perfect storm for a new virus to proliferate. And it's thought the mosquito might be able to harbor more than one virus, like that clipping of the paper showed. Maybe it could even harbor three viruses. And this is when we were in Rio. Um, 
In 2002, there was the worst dengue outbreak the city ever faced. Um, one third of the workforce was um, unable to work because of dengue, and there was a problem with the vector control pro program that had been significantly reduced because of economic problems. We have to remember that Brazil is facing severe economic problems again, and that the vector control measures had been um, uh, decreased significantly because of financial problems prior to Zika emerging. So microcephaly and the epidemic. This is a clipping uh, from the newspaper, also in November, about um, the cases and the, the concerns for microcephaly. And this is pregnant women and their fear of Zika and uh, how we will attack the villain mosquito that preys on pregnant women. So that's what the heading site. Uh, so where did this all start? Um, what is microcephaly? It's a, it's a pretty, uh, your brain does not develop and your head circumference is low. There are actually several definitions of microcephaly um, if you look at, at different textbooks. But microcephaly in general is responsible for developmental delay, vi vision and hearing impairments, and uh, many different neurologic problems, including seizures. Uh, it was noted that there was a sudden increase in the number of infants who were born with small heads in, in northeastern Brazil, particularly in the states of Pernambuco and Paraíba in uh, the second semester of 2015. Zika virus was identified in the amniotic fluid of two pregnant women who had babies with microcephaly. Um, uh, there was a report from the French Polynesia that there had been 17 infants born to, with microcephaly at the time that the virus was, uh, was there. And uh, it was definitely a big surge in problems noted. Uh, and 14 states uh, had reported this in northeastern Brazil. And the rates of reported microcephaly were 20 times that of what was uh, expected in those countries. And back in November, um, health authorities in Brazil were saying that this is highly probable that there's a link between Zika and microcephaly. And uh, these were the number of cases reported by states uh, in, as in November when uh, it reached Rio. And this is a paper that came out in January 2016 in uh, Annals of Internal Medicine. This is Brazilian um, health ministry uh, data just showing the rise, the black bars are cases of microcephaly, a number of cases of microcephaly per month, per year. And um, northeastern Brazil are the black bars, southeastern is Brazil, and is a map here of Brazil uh, showing the hot spots. And the standard definition of microcephaly, there isn't, but it's usually accepted as fetal head measurements that fall below two standard deviations below the mean, which is expected for gestation, or when it falls under the third percentile for uh, in the growth chart. So I'm going to pick Carlos. Like the Argentinians and the Brazilians have a long stand rivalry in soccer. And of course, this study came from an Argentinian group, um, which uh, said that uh, Zika, it's not really a study, but it's a, it's a concern that, Zika, uh, that there was no link between Zika virus and microcephaly but that there was a causal connection between the pesticides being used to treat, um, uh, er eradicate the vector, and um, the neurologic symptoms that we were seeing, that this was actually due to environmental exposure to a pesticide. So uh, they thought that this was contaminating the water supplies, and that's the reason why women were having babies with microcephaly, especially in northeastern Brazil. And this was published in February, and it became viral on the internet. And as a result, several counties in Brazil actually eliminated their vector control, which is really a bad idea if we're talking about an arthropod and it's a uh, born disease. So uh, there's still a lot of concern about this, and people think, including my sister, that this, this is due to pesticides. <laughs> and, and I think, how can you think that? But um, this has been very powerful <laughs> impact. We've had a lot of arguments over that. So this is, uh, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the diagnostics and the um, um, challenges with diagnosis. This is a CDC slide showing how you differentiate Zika and dengue and all the algorithms you go through in terms of trying to identify the virus and make your diagnosis. So uh, we have a new FDA uh, uh, CDC license test for Z uh, Zika virus by serology. It's called the antibody capture enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. It's called the MAC ELISA. And here in the US, it would be very helpful because most people have not had dengue and would be able to uh, identify patients who have prior uh, Zika virus exposure and have developed antibodies. 
Um, however, when you're talking about endemic areas, and this is a listing of all our patients in Brazil the day they were enrolled in the study where serologies were done for dengue, IgG. As you can see, everyone's positive for dengue. And I actually am not showing you the data, but when they were positive by PCR for Zika, they were developing IgM to dengue as well. There's so much cross-reactivity that the serologies that we have, at least right now, can't differentiate between one and the other. So when you talk about serum studies in dengue endemic areas, they're sort of worthless because of this reason. And that's why people think there might not be a symptomatic Zika virus infection unless we were able to identify someone in the U.S. who got it who had no history of prior dengue uh, antibodies. In our cohort, 88% of women uh, had uh, dengue IgG antibodies at enrollment. So um, this is part of the group I've been working with. It's one of their papers looking at Zika virus sequence from the amniotic fluid of two women who had um, babies with microcephaly in northeastern Brazil. These specimens were shipped to uh, Fiocruz in Rio, and they were sequenced. And the, the, um, the virus is identical to the Zika virus from the French Polynesia determining a trait, but definitely the, the virus was identified in amniotic fluid, which shows that there is a growing body of evidence uh, that um, Zika is related to the issues that we are finding. And this is a paper that came out in the New England Journal, I think about six weeks ago, which is a, a woman who was working as a volunteer in northeastern Brazil um, from Slovenia. She became pregnant, and she returned to Slovenia to have her baby. And the initial ultrasounds were normal. By 29 weeks of gestation, um, they saw that the fetus was not developing and had uh, brain lesions, that the brain was not developing. The pregnancy was terminated, and um, PCR was done on brain tissues, and, and Zika virus was identified in the fetus. Um, so that's another possible link um, that's been um, published. And then, of course, uh, this is one of uh, colleagues, Ana Maria Bispo, who uh, actually does all the PCR for Zika virus in Brazil. She's very overwhelmed. Um, <laughs> She, she, they have an editorial talking about uh, microcephaly just being the tip of the iceberg, that probably there is something behind it beyond microcephaly, and other things could be related to this, um, these findings that we are, we're, are happening. And there are reports of macular atrophy in children with my, in infants with microcephaly. Here's a picture of uh, the retina of a baby, and you can see the macular lesion. Anyone can see that? So. Fiocruz Institute. So we'll talk about Fiocruz. Uh, we worked with Fiocruz for many years. There's this little castle in the back there, which you can see when you arrive in the airport from Rio and you're driving down the freeway to go to the south area of Rio. You can see this little Moorish castle, which was built in the 1900s. Fiocruz is an um, um, acronym for Fundação Oswaldo Cruz. Oswaldo Cruz is this uh, senior gentleman here with the mustache. He was the one who actually eradicated uh, dengue uh, from Brazil, and he was an epidemiologist and and was great. I mean, we should actually bring him back for the current problem. And and the person down there is Carlos Chagas, who was actually hit one of his uh, collaborators, best friend, who also worked at the at the foundation, which was later re renamed Oswaldo Cruz. They were such great friends that actually Trypanosoma cruzi, identified by Chagas, is named after his buddy Oswaldo Cruz. And you can see all these very uh, distinguished gentlemen, including Einstein, and at Fio Cruz in a visit, um, there, and this is from the 1930s. And then, of course, not trying to be pretentious, we don't want to be next to Einstein or Osvaldo Cruz, but these are my friends <laughs> from medical school. <laughs> and that's, we're very cool, and we're all women. And they're, see, in the other picture, there's no men, I thought, and we're here in Southern California, and we have sunglasses, and we're like taking nice pictures. And these are my colleagues. Um, we know each other from medical school, and Claudia and Patricia, who actually have been working very hard on the Zika virus um, epidemic. Patricia is the head of the uh, Flavivirus lab at Fiocruz. So um, she's been involved since 2007 in surveillance efforts for dengue, and she conducts the surveillance of all dengue uh, for the city of Rio de Janeiro. And in 2012, she developed a dengue surveillance project for pregnant women, mother-infant pairs. She has uh, been following them for years, and we actually worked on, um, on a grant that we eventually didn't submit because it was very complicated. Um, but that's where this comes from. So uh, in late 2015, when these cases of Zika virus started arising, uh, what they did is they modified their consent form and their prospective cohort 
to actually actively screen for Zika virus by reverse transcriptase PCR in the blood and urines of, of women who were coming in with a rash. So they said it was out in the media and word of mouth, if, if you have a rash and you happen to be pregnant, you can come to the Fear Cruz Foundation to our febrile illness clinic. Um, you don't have to have a fever, just, just need to have a rash, and we will test you for Zika. You have to realize that not Zika virus PCR, even though it's available free of cost in the public health system, only very few places in Rio will do that. So patients were interested in coming so they could get their testing. And of course, serologies are not, uh, not even done because they're considered so un unreliable. So actually, we have um, 280 women enrolled in this cohort. 280 women up to f the end of February had come in with the rash within the last five days to be tested, pregnant women, to be tested for Zika virus. Our attack rate is about 79%, so it's, it's very high. So I'm going to present data to you um, on 88 patients um, that have had all their PCR studies to date. The other, uh, other data still has to be analyzed for the remaining patients. So 88 pregnant women came in to the Fia Cruz facility. They were tested either in blood or urine um, for uh, Zika virus by RT-PCR. 72, 72 of these women were positive and 16 were negative. Of these 72, shortly after testing, they had uh, first trimester abortions and uh, 42 women actually uh, were referred, actually all of them were referred for ultrasound at the Fia Cruz obstetrical facility, but 28 of them declined having ultrasounds. They just didn't want to know and they didn't, they'd say, whenever the baby's born, I'll find out. But 42 actually went for their ultrasounds at uh, the Institute Fernandes Figueira, which is actually the referral institute for pediatrics and obstetrics from Fia Cruz, which is at another campus. And eight babies have been delivered to date. Um, these pregnancies, 78 pregnancies are still ongoing, including the women uh, who are Zika virus negative by PCR. Uh, they are, their data is being abstracted from their prenatal care records. They're not followed at the same place, but they are in prenatal care. And all these women who are negative also had ultrasounds as part of their prenatal care. So these women came from all over. This is a map of the state of Rio. As you can see, some of them came from places um, that were even uh, two or three hours um, away. Most of the cases of transmission happened in, uh, in Rio. There was uh, early on when the study first started, there might have been one or two patients that actually came in who had visited northeastern Brazil and contracted the infection there and shortly thereafter came back to Rio. As you can see, uh, many of them share a history of other family members being ill. They live in the same place. They'll be bitten by the same mosquito. Um, actually, 21% of the women in the Zika positive group actually had partners who were uh, ill with Zika virus. We don't have any um, data on the partners yet. Um, uh, there was 30% reported prior history of dengue, but prior history of dengue is unreliable, as we said, because 88% actually had dengue antibodies. Dengue can be asymptomatic. Um, they came from all sorts of economic strata uh, in Brazil. And what is interesting, most of them were in the middle trimester of pregnancy, 52%, uh, 53% of the Zika positive, but there were women who were infected early in pregnancy and women who were infected late in pregnancy. So this is just a graph of our data. We have data on 42 women who had ultrasounds who were Zika virus positive. They were referred for ultrasonography and were followed over time. And we, have, we know when they were infected because that's the time where the PCR was positive. So we had two women infected at eight weeks who had abnormal ultrasounds, two at 12, one at 21, two at 22 weeks, one at 25, one at 26. And as you can see, even at 35 weeks of gestation, we had abnormal ultrasounds. This is the time of infection, not the time of the ultrasound. The ultrasounds were done later. So this is like, I think, the most important slide, which tells you about all the ultrasounds that were abnormal and the babies born to date. We have had eight babies uh, born to date. Um, two ultrasounds actually identified fetal death very late in pregnancy. We had one woman infected at 25 weeks uh, who had an ultrasound done at 30 and actually 33 weeks. And when she came in for her 36 week ultrasound, because we, we they started following patients more closely, the baby was dead. Um, so that was one episode of fetal demise. And then we had another woman infected at 32 weeks who went at 38 weeks for her ultrasound. She didn't have any preceding ultrasounds. Also, the fetus was dead, which is really unusual for you who, who do obstetrics. You realize that's not a very common um, finding. 
We had another baby whose mother was infected at 35 weeks, and she went to have a repeat ultrasound at 40 weeks, and there was actually no amniotic fluid in, in the uterus, and she had not had uh, ruptured membranes. That ultrasound showed anhydramnios and IUGR. That baby was actually delivered emergently and had some problems in the first 48 hours of life with feeding, and you know, his APGAR scores were low, but he seems to be normal, although his EEG has some nonspecific findings. The baby was actually not IUGR. It was due to the technical difficulty of doing an ultrasound with no amniotic fluid, and also at very late gestational ages, it's, there's a 20% error rate. But what I want to show is also the other pathology that we identified. There was a woman infected at eight weeks. The baby had microcephaly, cerebral calcifications, abnormal middle cerebral artery, and was IUGR by ultrasound. When this baby was born, the baby really didn't have IUGR, but had very severe microcephaly. Um, this was confirmed by a CT done in the first 24 hours of life. There were uh, cerebral calcifications everywhere. There was global cerebral atrophy, and there were macular lesions in both eyes, which are very significant, and um, this baby has been born. Then there are a, a series of pregnancies here. That w they're aligned by gestational age at infection. We have another woman infected at eight weeks, in which the baby seems to be um, um, uh, have cere cerebellar atrophy as well. We have one infected at 12 weeks with se very severe malformations. Um, that baby has actually been, um, uh, there's been an amniocentesis done with genetic testing, and so far everything's been um, done. There was another one who had an isolated cisterna magna. There's another one with calcifications, periventricular calcifications. There, there's, there's another one that has the middle cerebral artery flow. This should be less than the fifth percentile, not the 95th. That's a typo um, on the pulsatile index, and, and we don't know if, what, what is the implication of that. Um, there, there was another baby that also had oligohydramnias, IUGR, findings of placental insufficiency, and had microcephaly, but actually the microcephaly was because of the IUGR. When the baby was born, the head is small, but the baby's all small, so that's proportional. And that baby also had problems at birth and has macular lesions as well. Uh, we had another baby with IUGR who also was born small for gestational age, even though the, it said there was microcephaly on ultrasound. But at the time the baby was born, the baby was proportionally all small as well. Um, we have had another two babies uh, whose mothers had normal ultrasounds that have been delivered and appear to be normal as well. So we will be following up on all the babies and we'll have more data. But this is actually data from the last two weeks um, that we've just put together. And this is just picture of cerebral calcifications in patient number 24. Baby was born small for gestational age. And this is the baby with severe microcephaly that has periventricular calcifications and all sorts of other malformations. So this was plotted by um, Stephanie and Carla, who are here on the audience from our OB department. And this is just looking at the fetal biometry by ultrasonography. And this is a measure of the head. It's the bipareidal. Uh, diameter, and as you can see, there are three babies, 12, 24, and 19, who are following off the curve in terms of small heads. Baby number 24 was actually just small for gestational age. That's why when you plot his head, it's so tiny. But baby no number 19 definitely had microcephaly. He's been born. And um, this is another way of looking at this, looking at head circumference, which you can do by ultrasound. And you can also see that there are babies falling off the curve. And here is the estimated fetal weight, which tells you about um, IUGR, in intrauterine growth restriction. And you can see that's pre present in babies 20, 12 and 24 that were born and had uh, were small for gestational age. So what are the patterns of pathology that we've identified? Um, there are fetal abnormalities of the central nervous system uh, in all these ultrasounds. We have cerebral calcifications. There's cerebellar atrophy. There's non-development of important cerebral structures like the pouch, the Blake's pouch cyst, which I had to look up. That's when the cerebellum doesn't develop. There's overall cerebral atrophy, and there is microcephaly. But actually, only one of our babies had true microcephaly of the eight that have been born to date. A macular lesions or macular atrophy was noted in two of the two infants born. And these were all infections that happened from eight to 27 weeks of gestation. So you could still have problems in the second trimester of pregnancy. Then we saw a pattern of impairment of fetal growth, uh, and this restriction could, could be it combined with CNS problems or not. It could be an isolated finding. 
And there, that seems to be due to a lack of adequate development or due to placental insufficiency. Those babies are not being fed by the placenta adequately. They don't grow. And something happens that the amniotic fluid also disappears. We had three cases of uh, oligohydramnios or anhydramnios. And um, these, this is happening in, in, in cases between 8 to 26 weeks. And then there's a, there's a pattern of pure placental insufficiency, anhydramnias or oligohydramnias, which is probably why those two fetuses died and the baby at 40 weeks almost had fetal demise as well if he hadn't been identified by ultrasound as having no amniotic fluid. We can see a mixed pattern. And uh, the data is concerning because um, it was seen in 12 of 42 babies. However, if you look on the bright side, 71% were normal. Um, no pathology was seen. This is all Zika virus uh, positive women by PCR. And this is just to identify microcephaly. I'm just showing you this sort of gruesome picture about one of the stillborns being delivered. But I just want to mention that all these babies who were delivered had several rounds of umbilical cord around their neck. They had no amniotic fluid. So Carla can comment if that's common when there's fetal demise. But um, we saw this pattern in three of the babies of no amniotic fluid. And actually, all of them were born with a lot of um, with the umbilical cord around the neck. So it's sort of uh, interesting that we have this coincidence. And this is just to show that these findings, they're not made up. They're consistent with what the CDC has reported in nine pregnant women in the United States who have um, imported infection. I'm assuming the report that wasn't very clear that they all had serologic diagnosis uh, made, not by PCR, because they came back. Uh, and this is a retrospective study. Um, there were, these nine women all had the serologies done, and three delivered babies, two healthy babies. One baby had microcephaly, two had miscarriages, but it's unclear if Zika was the cause. We also saw miscarriages in a cohort, but more importantly, we're seeing last trimester uh, fetal demise. Uh, two women's actually uh, interrupted their pregnancy, but one of them, the fetus, had an undeveloped brain as well, and two pregnancies are continuing. So um, this is sort of... Uh, combined evidence showing that there is indeed a problem and that we're seeing an issue with uh, Zika virus infection. So finally, for the future, very important to know, do antibodies confer lifelong immunity? If you're going to develop a vaccine, this is the first thing you want to know if the antibodies will be protective. Obviously, there doesn't seem to be a protective mechanism of dengue antibodies in preventing um, Zika virus infections. We have to look at this more closely. Um, there's been um, some people have said that maybe enhanced antibodies to dengue could actually be detrimental. Others think it could be protective. I have to say that my colleague has said that she's seen, seen Zika virus twice um, in two patients um, over a three-month period. Whether they stopped having the infection and became PCR positive, again, it, it, it remains to be known. But um, it would be important to figure out if you can really get it more than once or you just are infectious for a longer period of time. The other thing, would passive antibodies prevent infection? Because we might be able to give this to infected women uh, at the time that they're diagnosed with infection, at the acute time of infection. And we know that vaccines for flaviviruses are, have been developed. Brazil is now rolling over a dengue vaccine, a tetravalent dengue vaccine program, which uh, seems promising. There's definitely a successful vaccine against yellow fever and Japanese encephalitis, whether you do a killed virus, attenuated virus, a recombinant vaccine, that still remains to be determined. Of course, vector control is most prominent and most important. And I think what is important from this data is that you should not really um, stop people um, from eliminating the vector because you really need it to uh, reduce spread of disease. Uh, I have not seen anything about antivirals in development yet when I reviewed the literature, but I'm sure someone's looking at that as well. And we definitely need improved diagnostics that can differentiate between um, uh, Zika and dengue antibodies as well. So this is something that one of our media people um, in Vacation in Bahia gave to me. A mosquito can't be stronger than a whole country. We'll do Zika zero, and this is like a guide to eliminate all the, uh, all the places you could harbor um, the mosquito at your home. It's like a big guide. And then we're going to kill the mosquito, <laughs> zap it. And th these are my colleagues at Fiocruz. Um, this is Patricia and her whole crew of people who are uh, the dengue uh, flavivirus uh, arboviral group at Fiocruz who've been involved in, in all the data and collected all the data I've shown you. This is the person with the Zika hat. This was Carnival. They had a Zika hat. And he's the our obstetrician. Who, he and his crew performed all the ultrasounds on the 42 patients. That's Jose. Paulo um, Pereira. 
And I want to thank uh, everyone, Patricia especially, Mayumi Wakimoto, who's a Brazilian living in Portugal, who is our statistician and did all the statistical analyses. We've submitted um, this for publication. Jose Paulo Pereira Jr. ROB, as I mentioned. I also want to thank Claudia, who works in uh, um, San Diego at a research institute who's developing some neutralizing antibody tests with us, and my colleagues here at UCLA, Carla Jansen, Stephanie from the OB department, Dr. Cherry, who's been very interested in this because it resembles rubella, and Dr. Bryson because she's donated all these kits for us to continue our research with no funding. That's it. Thank you.